<clears throat> Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Baker Institute this evening for a special conversation on Israel's uh, security challenges. Uh, this discussion is especially uh, timely for at least uh, two reasons. First, uh, we are witnessing the ongoing efforts by Secretary of State uh, John Kerry to forge an Israeli-Palestinian agreement, uh, which hopefully begins to build trust between the parties and end the conflict on terms which facilitate mutual peace and security. Indeed, our speaker tonight has stated that, quote, peace must be built on a system of trust. As many of you know, uh, the Baker Institute's conflict resolution program focuses on the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. Our policy report last year, written by our Israeli and Palestinian fellows, addressed the American role necessary to bring the two sides together. The report was given directly to President Obama and Secretary Kerry when they visited Ramallah last March. And as part of the Baker Institute's recently formed Center for the Middle East, we are currently preparing follow-up reports in support of the ongoing negotiations. Now, the second reason for the timeliness of our topic is the commemor commemoration today of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, in which we remind ourselves of the six million Jews and millions of others who perished from the Nazis' campaign of genocidal hate. And as we do so, we remain committed to fighting those forces of prejudice and violence with greater humanity, compassion, and justice. Our speaker this evening was quite literally born out of this atrocity of the Holocaust. We were discussing this just before uh, we came into the Commons this evening. He is the son of two Holocaust survivors, born in Ashkelon, Israel in 1952. He served Israel as a commando in the IDF before joining the Israeli Security Agency, also known as Shin Bet, as an air marshal and advancing to become director of the agency under the late Ariel Sharon during the Second Intifada. After leaving the International Security Agency, he entered politics, was very active, and served as Minister of Public Security and most recently as Minister of Home Front Defense. He is also currently the chairman of the Foundation for the Benefit of the Holocaust Victims in Israel. He is one of the most active political figures in Israel, and we are truly delighted to have him here tonight. Please welcome Mr. Avi Dichter to the Baker Institute. Board. Well, shalom and good evening. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, talking about the Middle East, the, I would say maybe the different Middle East in the last uh, three months, the only way that I can compare it to something is to a jungle. It's not that before the, what is named Arab Spring uh, broke out, it was a uh, a peaceful Switzerland, but uh, what happened during the last uh, three years, it's, it reminds me of the jungle. And you know, in a jungle, there are some basic rules. The fastest lion in the jungle, when he wakes up in the morning, has to run faster than uh, the slowest deer in order to get some food to eat. And if you are the slowest deer or so the fastest deer in the jungle. And you wake up in the morning, you have to run faster than the slowest lion in order to survive. Conclusion of what I've just said, when you wake up in the jungle, never mind if you are a lion or a deer, first thing to do, start running. <laughs> but the only question, are you running? in the right direction. And uh, I just want to show you, before I start my talk, just the four key countries in the Middle East that uh, I found that not many people are fully aware of the Middle East that we are speaking about. 
And the slide just gives you the proportions in three elements about the four key countries in the Middle East. Middle East, when I say it's the large Middle East, from Morocco in the west, the Atlantic, up to Afghanistan in the east, and from Turkey in the north down to Yemen, Somalia in the south. That's a large Middle East. And as you see, we speak about the main three uh, Muslim countries with a different DNA. We have Egypt, which is a Muslim country, a Sunni country, you know, amongst the 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, Sunnis are close to 90%. So Egypt is a Muslim country, Sunni country, and an Arab country. An Arab country which gives them an advantage towards three, more than 300 million people who live in 22 Arab countries. Then we have Turkey, also at the club of the 80, uh, 85 million people, which is a Muslim country, a Sunni country, but a non-Arab country. And the differences are very, very essential to understand what's going on in the Middle East in general, and in the current Middle East in particular, related to the state of Israel. The third Muslim country, which is Iran, which is a Muslim country, but a non-Sunni country, it's Shiite, and a non-Arab country. And of course, the fourth country is a non-Muslim, non-Sunni, non-Arab country, that's the state of Israel. And uh, when you see the land, unfortunately, the block is bigger than it should be, but we had to put the flag, you know, it's, uh, so we need to put it a little bit bigger. And when we analyze the Middle East and trying to understand what's really going on, I think that up until three years ago, just before the Arab Spring, every crash, clash, and every problem that occurred between countries in the Middle East used to be related to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But the Arab Spring explained to everybody that uh, facts are a bit different. What happened in Egypt, either the revolution by the people three years ago, or the military coup last June has nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What happens during the last two years in Syria has nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, except maybe the injured Syrians who are uh, coming in hundreds to Israel to get treatment in Israeli hospitals through the Golan Heights. What happened in Lebanon, due to the participation of Hezbollah in Syria uh, sided with Bashar al-Assad, has nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And the instability started to be in Lebanon during the last year. It's not because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The instability in Iraq has nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and Afghanistan and uh, as we understand, the U.S. is going to pull out its troops the coming months from Afghanistan. And we all understand that it might be that Afghanistan will be back to be the uh, guest house and maybe the greenhouse of terrorists as it used to be before, or as we say in Arabic, titi titi, metal marokhti, metal majiti, which means what happened before is going to repeat itself in the coming uh, years, right after the uh, pulling out of troops from uh, Afghanistan. It has nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Of course, instability in Libya, Yemen, uh, Tunisia, or even in uh, North Sudan, South Sudan, uh, it has nothing to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. When Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries are pouring money, either in Egypt, or in Syria, or in Lebanon, in Syria to the rebels, in Lebanon to the uh, Lebanese army. It's not in order to strengthen those three countries against the Israeli threat. Totally not. 
totally different goals, which has nothing to do with the State of Israel, let alone with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So the question is, the inevitable question, so when Saudi Arabia is pouring $12 billion in Egypt and $3 billion in Lebanon, what's the threat against uh, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries? Who are they afraid of? Egypt? Egypt is totally busy with itself. Is it Turkey? Turkey is, as, as I said, a non-Arab country. And meanwhile, they don't participate in what's going on in the Arab countries who are involved in the, uh, in the last uh, spring or the Arab Spring. But they're not, they don't put the money in order to create something against the state of Israel because they don't see Israel as a threat. The real reason is Iran. Iran is the nightmare of Saudi Arabia and Iran is the nightmare of Egypt because both countries understand that when Iran already equipped with long-range missiles who reach today the distance of 2,500 kilometers, which is double the distance between Iran and Israel, and they understand very well that if there is a warhead that is going to be put in those long-range missiles, so those warheads, after being dropped in Israel, the Iranians don't need the missiles back to Iran. It means there are far targets than the State of Israel. And now exactly, Egypt knows exactly what does it mean, a far target than the State of Israel. Saudi Arabia understands as well. So when Bashar al-Assad, when Bashar al-Assad's regime was about to collapse after a few tough months of uh, clashes between the uh, regime and the uh, rebels, Iran, who was for the last decade since the toppling of Saddam Hussein in Iraq, they started to build the northern axis, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. This northern axis aimed to separate between Turkey and the Arab countries. It goes all along Turkey, from Iran, through Iraq, through Syria, up to Lebanon. And in the competition between the three key countries and the Muslim countries in the Middle East, Iran understands that Turkey is a threat on one side and Egypt is a threat on the other side. Iran understood that they have to be involved in the Arab Middle East, and the best way to be involved in the Arab Middle East is by creating some indirect attacks against Israel. In order to create this situation, they built the two proxies, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in the Gaza Strip, and both Hezbollah at the beginning, after the Intifada uh, was broke out in 2000, Hamas tied the relations with Iran and started to be sponsored, trained, guided by the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guards. By the way, today, after the Muslim Brotherhood lost their uh, superiority in Egypt and lost the regime in Egypt, the Palestinian version of the Muslim Badhud, which is Hamas according to their charter, are renewing the relations with Iran, understanding that with Egypt, they are going to face probably tough problems. I'll come to it a little bit later. So when Syria understood, when Iran understood that in Syria, they are going to lose or to start to lose 50% of their axis, because they understand if Bashar al-Assad regime is going to be toppled in Syria, Lebanon is going to be changed. And they tried to do all efforts, 
by all means to strengthen the regime of Bashar al-Assad. It started with direct aid by sending the Revolutionary Guards to Syria. It continued with the other uh, troops of the, uh, what they call the Iraqi militia, Sheet, that went into uh, Syria mainly to protect the road between Damascus Airport uh, International and the headquarters or the regime, uh, the headquarters regime of uh, Syria, of Bashar al-Assad's regime in Damascus. Later on, they sent other troops, Sunni troops, by the way, to side with Bashar al-Assad's regime, but to be seen as if they are part of the rebels. They were sent from Iraq in thousands, but mainly during the last uh, maybe six, seven months, when more than 500 terrorists, arch terrorists, that fought against the United States and the Allies in Afghanistan, later on in Iraq, were jailed in Abu Ghraib jail. 500 terrorists that are escaping from Abu Ghraib jail, trust me, you know, in, in the States, uh, let's take uh, El Catraz uh, in San Francisco. El Catraz is a scout camp compared to Abu Ghraib uh, jail. And if 500 terrorists were escaped from Abu Ghraib jail, it has to be done in kind of assistance by the regime in Iraq. And all those hundreds, in addition to the thousands, were sent in, into Syria and it took to the rebels a while until they understood that practically it's a Trojan horse amongst the rebels and now they have fightings between the real rebels and against the uh, Sunnis uh, troops sent from uh, Iraq uh, in order to be part of the uh, assistance to the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Now, when Iran understood at the beginning it's not enough to send the Revolutionary Guard and the Shiite militia, they pushed forward Hezbollah. Hezbollah is very close to Syria. They crossed in thousands the border, and for a while they've succeeded to block the uh, successes of the rebels in Syria. But only for a while they've lost many hundreds of terrorists. They got killed, many of them got injured, and uh, Iran understood that mainly after the third attack using chemical weapon by the Syrians, the last one, the third one, caused more than 1,200 fatalities, mainly civilians. And they understood that they have to do something in order to prevent the United States strike against the chemical site. So Iran is behind the joint venture between Syria and Russia and pushed forward and practically sacrificed the chemical Syrian, the Syrian chemical weapon in order to reach an agreement with the Western countries led by the United States. And that's what is practically signed uh, and blocked for a while the uh, American strike or maybe the uh, Western countries strike in Syria. But it didn't stop the bloodshed in Syria. Probably Bashar al-Assad and his people understood that they've got license to continue killing another 120,000 people, to injure another half a million people. Nobody, by the way, speaks about the injured people in Syria. But those who are familiar with the proportions, you get one to five killed people to injured people and to continue creating more and more refugees. We have today in Syria close to three million refugees, either within Syria or in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Beside that, Iran understood that it's a good opportunity for, her, for them to change the tactics, but not the strategy about the, what we call, what they call the uh, nuclear project and what we call, the Western countries, the nuclear weapon project. There's no debate amongst the intelligence services worldwide, not even the Western countries or the Arab countries, about the fact that Iran was on the track to build nuclear bombs. 
Bombs are not bomb. Nobody builds one bomb. And uh, Iran made a tactical step to freeze the development of the uh, nuclear project in order to try to recover their economy. And those who are uh, familiar with what's going on, the slot in this dam is widening from day to day. You get Russians, you get Chinese, you get European companies. It's too much money to be able to keep this slot narrow as it was supposed to be under the understanding or the agreement between the Western countries and uh, Iran. Beside that, by the way, Iran uh, gave some signals to the Western countries that only we, Iran, we may stabilize the escalation in Iraq. Only we, Iran, may stabilize the situation in Afghanistan post the uh, putting out of the American troops in the coming uh, months. If I have to sum it up in one sentence, I would say that Iran is schooling the Western countries, is simply schooling the Western countries. Now, if we take this northern axis that Iran is fighting by all means to keep it strong, and we do understand why Israel is so determined to keep the Jordan Valley as its eastern line and not to make the 67 line at the west side of the West Bank as its eastern line. Because try to imagine that in different circumstances, and in the whole region today, we have only the tiny country of Jordan, which is very small and a bit fragile due to the complexities within this country, almost 70% Palestinians. So try to imagine that in some kind of changes, Iran might find itself, or we might find Iran, 20 meters from Jerusalem and 20 kilometers from Tel Aviv. That's why Israel is determined to make sure that the border with the eastern side of the state of Israel and the western side of the Arab countries will be the Jordan Valley and not the 67 line. If we go to the other side of the state of Israel, into Egypt, you know that the changes in Egypt were dramatic and nobody, neither intelligence services, with all respect to the Israelis, the Americans, the British, the Germans, and even the Arab intelligence services, nor any other uh, diplomatic people in the world, nobody expected the changes in Egypt just in three years. The toppling of Hosni Mubarak, the uh, rising of the Muslim Brotherhood, the success of the Muslim Brotherhood in the parliament that got 47% of the seats, and they supposed to be the moderate amongst the ultra extremists, the Salafis, who've got 25%, try to imagine a parliament with 70% two percent of extremists and ultra extremists. So when the military coup uh, occurred in Egypt and uh, the one who led it was Abdel Fattah Sisi, that I think that he really deserves the, uh, to be the man of the year. I think it was in uh, some American uh, uh, newspapers or magazines. I know that uh, it's hard for uh, many people, mainly the Egyptians, to accept the fact that in last June it was a military coup. I remember I attended an event uh, a few months ago and uh, an Egyptian guy told me, Avi, I beg to differ. It was not uh, a military coup. It was a revolution by the people. I said, who said it? Said it's, uh, it was said uh, loud and clear by Abdel Fattah Sisi himself. So I said, you know, it reminds me of the story about the Jewish village, the Jewish state in Poland, when the rabbi, the Moyle, 
uh, the moil, uh, you know, the eighth day you have to moil every uh, Jewish baby. And uh, the moil used to put in his window of his office a huge cake, three floors of cram and candies and all this kind of sweets. And people asked him, Rabbi Moshe, why do you put such a cake in your window? And he said, what do you recommend me to put there? <laughs> so I think that's, that's the problem. Abdel Fattah Sisi cannot, cannot say anything different than a revolution by the people. But I think we don't have to care how do they call it. Practically, I think that Egypt saved itself from itself. Those who understand what does it mean, the charter of the Muslim Brotherhood, it is something much wider than Egypt. That's why Saudi Arabia was nervous. That's why the other Gulf countries were nervous. Jordan was nervous. And that's why when the United States blocked and freezed for a while the $1.5 billion that the military assistance to Egypt, Saudi Arabia collected within a short time $12 billion and poured it in Egypt. They understood why. From the Israeli side, I think that uh, for the first time, we see that there is a common interest between Israel and Egypt. For years, under Hosni Mubarak and under the Muslim Brotherhood, Sinai Peninsula was a safe haven. Terrorists were there, smuggling of weapons from Iran, from Sudan, and later on from Libya, were smuggled via Sinai Peninsula right into the Gaza Strip, and practically, the Gaza Strip became a totally uh, area of military equipment under terrorists connected with Iran, uh, used to be connected and now renewed their connection with Iran. It's very odd that in such a talk of an Israeli guy, I'm speaking about the Middle East and haven't said almost anything about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But what happened during the last three years changed the agenda of everyone. I'm sure that uh, uh, Ambassador Jurejan here in your institute, it's the same. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict became a very small issue compared to the changes in the Middle East. But the Israeli-Palestinian conflict still exists. And uh, in my eyes, there is no other way to solve the problem between Israel and the Palestinians unless it will be based on two-state solution. We have today 12 million people between the Mediterranean and the Jordan Valley. You can divide it in two ways. One, to say we have 8 million people in Israel and 4 million people in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. There's another way which is more relevant for me, I believe for you as well, we have today six million Jews between the Mediterranean and the Jordan Valley, and six million non-Jewish, non-Jews, mainly Arabs. You know, I uh, tried to pass uh, in the Israeli parliament a basic law, we don't have a constitution, so I tried to pass a basic law, named Israel is the nation state for the Jewish people. Democratic and Jewish people. Jewish and democratic uh, uh, state. And I think that without having a two-state solution, we might be either democratic or Jewish. We won't be able to be Jewish and democratic state. So uh, when we hear about the discussions under the American umbrella, by the way, I believe that the American efforts to reach understandings and to reach a peace treaty is a true effort. But there are some rules in the Middle East that we all have to understand. If there is no secret channel between the Prime Minister of Israel and the President of the Palestinian Authority, I doubt if we shall be able to proceed. Because the trust exists today between Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Abbas is on the level of the Dead Sea. Lower than that, you cannot go. So President Obama and the Secretary of State Kerry, they can 
really do a lot of things. They cannot replace Netanyahu and Abbas in creating this trust needed between the two uh, leaders in order to go forward towards a peace treaty. If we all remember Menachem Begin as Prime Minister of Israel and Sadat as President of Egypt, when the level of trust between those two leaders was created, Sadat landed in Jerusalem and all the rest was history. That was the trust between Prime Minister Rabin and King Hussein. And that was the trust between Prime Minister Rabin and at that time, uh, Chairman Arafat. All these trusts were created in secret channels. By the way, with not any interference of any other country, neither the US nor any other European country. I don't think that we have today uh, some kind of a secret channel, as far as I know. And you know, I believe that we have many businessmen here in this uh, room. There are two ways to end uh, a meeting. One way is by solving the problems, and the other way by finding an exit for the meeting. I'm afraid that without a certain level of trust, we are looking for an exit for the meeting. I know that some people say, if, you are, if Israel is going to lose the chance to get this peace treaty with Mahmoud Abbas, nobody in the Palestinian field will be able to supply such uh, conditions for peace treaty. So I beg to differ. I know Mahmoud Abbas for many years, before he became the president and after. I think that we, hope, we have to understand that it might happen that the peace treaty between Israelis and Palestinians will not be in the era of Mahmoud Abbas. We don't have a cliff behind Mahmoud Abbas, same as we don't have a cliff behind any other Israeli leader. And it might happen that we shall uh, have to wait, but we have to make sure that the peace process with the Palestinians will be based on few phases that uh, same as it happened uh, at the Oslo Agreement, but over there it was not a full and a coherent agreement. We need to create a full and a coherent agreement between the two sides that will know for sure what's going to happen in every single phase, what Israel has to give and what we are going to get in return. And if it is going to last, the implementation of it, will take five years, 10 years, 15 years, it's okay, in my eyes. But for the first time, we have to understand that we need a full and current agreement about West Bank and Gaza Strip. Those who believe that Israel should negotiate about the West Bank and Gaza Strip will remain, I don't know to whom. Some people believe that Egypt will solve the density in the Gaza Strip. You know, Gaza Strip is 1.7 million people. And we came to the Gaza Strip in, th in 67, it was 330 square kilometers with 330,000 people, Gazans. Today it's the same 330 square kilometer with 1.7 million people. Some people, including Israelis, by the way, including ministers and members of the Knesset, believe that Egypt will solve the problem of the Gaza Strip. When I just asked some uh, senior people in Egypt about it, they laughed and said, Avi, we shall convert Judaism before giving a piece of land from Sinai. This, this time I trust them. So I think that we have to make sure that our negotiation with the Palestinian side about both West Bank and Gaza Strip is with one Palestinian state that has one law and one gun for internal security. And we have to make sure that those conditions will be well understood by all sides. And I know that some people say, Avi, or to other people, time is against you. So I, instead of putting a period, I put a question mark. 
Time is against you? Why? History shows that time is not uh, for sure in, against us. If you look backward, in 1947, the partition plan gave Israel 60% from the land, 60% from the 22,000 uh, square kilometer. Israel accepted it, or it was before the state of Israel, a year before. The Arabs rejected it, and we had the independence war, a tough war. But we got, at the end, a bigger country. Post-67 uh, war, when we got back to many areas that we failed to keep during the independence war, mainly in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem today, we have more Israelis that live in the area that used to be under Jordan up until 1967. And I'm telling you, no way, there's no leader in the world that will be able to bring Jerusalem back to the lines of 67. No way. Same it happens in some cluster of settlements. So I'm not sure the time is always against the state of Israel. And uh, even the other side, the Palestinians, must understand the time sometimes is charging them some prices. I know that some people are wondering about the determination of the state of Israel to exist in this Middle East, in this wide Middle East I just described, and under those, uh, those uh, proportions. You know, I recently met uh, a very famous uh, man, Professor Ali Wiesel, who got the Nobel Prize, a writer, and the Holocaust survivor. I'm a chairman of the foundation as a Ambassador Georgian said, I'm uh, chairman of the Foundation for the Benefits of Holocaust Survivors in Israel, something I'm doing voluntarily during the last eight months. And I went to meet with Ali Wiesel. I think he represents something that, for me, is very, very important. And over our uh, discussions, uh, we spoke about the importance of the state of Israel. And he told me, Avi, let me tell you something. I met once with the uh, President of the United States. And the President asked me, uh, Professor Wiesel, can you tell me what's the importance of the State of Israel to the Jewish people? And Professor Wiesel uh, told me that his answer was that the Jewish people were for uh, 2,000 years in exile after being expelled from the state of Israel by the Romans 2,000 years ago. And had the state of Israel was not established in 1948, the Jewish people would have been in exile for another 2,000 years, and they will survive. But once the State of Israel was established 66 years ago, if God forbidden the State of Israel is going to be destroyed, the Jewish people might disappear. So that's when, uh, when we, the Jewish people, when we say, Am Israel Chai, which means long live Israel, we practically mean in the same time to say the state of Israel exists. And when we say for 2,000 years, from every place in the world, from the exile, from the last place, every Jew is saying at the end of Yom Kippur, Leshana Ba next year in Jerusalem. By saying that, he means to say, long live Israel. And while we are here in the States, so let me say, God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Avi. Now the floor is open to questions. We have two microphones on each side. If you would uh, come up to the microphone, and uh, while, uh, don't be timid now, 
Uh, there we got one. But uh, I would like to ask you uh, one question while we have people uh, uh, formulating their questions. Avi, there is a, uh, uh, as we discussed earlier, this, this great film called The Gatekeepers uh, that uh, you are one of the stars of with uh, five of your other uh, former heads of Shin Bet, uh, in which uh, there was a very insightful look into the Israeli-Palestinian issue by six of uh, leaders in Israel of Shin Bet who no Israeli could question their loyalty to the state of Israel. And each one of them, uh, in, from different historic periods, uh, said what you said tonight, that there is no purely military solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and basically advocated the two-state solution. Uh, what has been the impact of this film in Israel, The Gatekeepers? Yeah, I must admit, <laughs> Ambassador George, I know it's a little bit embarrassing me to hear that I became a movie star at the age of 61 years old. It's, <laughs> it's too late. And I remember when uh, the producer of the movie, Dror Moret, uh, once called me from New York. Uh, as you know, there is a few weeks before the Oscar uh, Prize in uh, Hollywood, there, is, uh, uh, there are 60 film critics who are choosing the best movies or whatever. And he woke me up 6 o'clock in the morning in Israel and said, Avi, did you hear? Uh, we've got 53 out of 60 film critics decided that The Gatekeepers is the best documentary movie of the year. So I said, congratulations. He said, that's what you have to tell me? You know what does it mean? I said, hey, Dror, it's 6 o'clock in the morning. You woke me up. He said, well, I expect from someone who was head of Shin Bet to be a little more creative. So I said, send me the names of the seven who didn't vote for the movie. I'll take care of it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think that uh, we in Israel, we have heated debates whether it's a, a two leftist movie or uh, whether the, you know, it's only 90 minutes. We had another version that uh, broadcasted in Israel in the Channel One on TV, which is five hours, which, get, which gives the, uh, the background of the, of the heads of Shin Bet much in a much better way and explains the, uh, the background much better than the movie uh, succeeded to do. But then I met once of, uh, one of the uh, heads, former heads of uh, intelligence service, and he told, out of the Israel of course, one of the big intelligence services, and he told me, Avi, when I told him about the movie, leftist or whatever, he told me, Avi, you are simply missing the point. This movie is serving the Israeli democracy more than many other speeches, books, and whatever. Because you'll never, and we speak about the, uh, amongst the branch of uh, former heads, and we said loud and clear, there's no way that you'll get six heads of CIA, six heads of FBI, six heads of MI5, MI6, band there, another organization, you'll never get six heads that will be courageous enough, brave enough, uh, open enough to speak in front of a camera in such a transparent way about their thoughts. I don't know if it's good or bad, but I think that's, that's Israeli. That's the way we in Israel, we think about our uh, issues. I'm sure that had we opened another issue, for example, releasing terrorists in order to get a soldier, I'm sure that we are going to be in a debate with many other countries. That's the state of Israel. In my life, I sent many soldiers, and I was sent by many commanders to cross borders, to take risks, and always I knew that if God forbid something happened to me or something happened to them, we'll do all efforts to bring them back, either from Antebe in Uganda by a very risky operation or by exchanging terrorists. So that's the state of Israel, and I think that the gatekeepers, with all criticism and all the other issues, I think it's a, it's a good movie, although if I would have been the producer, 
I would uh, do it a little bit different, but it probably wouldn't go to uh, Oscar, and not even the, 50, the 53 uh, would vote for it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Asmat Al Halabi. I'm a PhD student in the history department. I won't uh, dignify your talk, which was racist and arrogant, with a real question. I'd just like to express my displeasure, displeasure to the ambassador that you would invite a war criminal of dictator's stature to this university. Thawra, Thawra, Hatta Al Nasr. Let me just say that the, uh, the Baker Institute at Rice University is an open and free forum for people to express their opinions from all sides. You can never achieve any peaceful resolution or come to accommodation, especially in struggles between peoples and nations without having an open and free debate. And we represent an open academic forum for debate. And uh, I reject your, uh, your commentary. Uh, just one remark, because at the, end, at the end of the, it's not a question, a remark, and maybe uh, Ambassador Georgian, you understood because it was said in Arabic. Let me translate for the people uh, here that probably didn't hear it or maybe didn't notice it was in Arabic. What he said, Asmat uh, al-Halabi, he said, revolution, revolution until the victory. Which is a very well-known slogan that uh, it's all uh, contains violence and uh, all right. You, okay, my name is Melvin Dow. I'm from Houston. Uh, Ari Shavit, in his popular book, uh, My Promised Land, uh, says that if Israel removed the settlements from the West Bank, that would not bring peace. There are too many other issues. But even so, he says it would be worth it because the occupation and the presence of Israel in the settlements has a destructive effect uh, on the morale and the principles of the IDF. Uh, I would like to know if you agree that, uh, that, that it has that destructive effect. Same thing that Yeshayahu Leibovitz has been saying for years. Related question, if Israel vacated the West Bank, I'm assuming Hamas would replace Fatah and the PA. Uh, talk to us about the risk of, uh, of up-to-date rockets uh, which would reach Ben-Gurion Airport and other population centers in Israel. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, Ari Shavid is a very good friend and he is really a writer a very good one and a very smart one. And I agree with him, by the way, that evacuating settlements never assisted, and I don't think that it's going to assist the Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace process, but it's part of the peace treaty. It's well understood between the two sides. In addition to that, I think that releasing terrorists as a gesture to the Palestinian Authority never assisted before, and I don't think it's part that such a gesture can assist uh, the uh, Palestinian uh, side to go forward. They have much different issues, but that's part of the prerogative of the Prime Minister who deals with the Palestinians directly and indirectly, to take those steps, but the history, the short history, showed us that these two issues do not promote anything in the peace process. But we have to remember, when Ariel Sharon as a prime minister disengaged from the Gaza Strip, he disengaged also from the West Bank, from four settlements, and from an area which is bigger three times than the whole Gaza Strip in 2005. I don't think that he did it unilaterally. He, uh, if he would have waited till the Palestinians will be part of this disengagement, trust me, till today, 
the disengagement wouldn't be uh, occurred on the ground. Which means that when we are speaking about a unilateral step, we have to understand that it should be just an Israeli discussion between ourselves. If we are trying to coordinate it with the Palestinians, it's not going to happen. And I think that we should focus on a peace process with the other side. We say in the Middle East, you don't clap hands with one hand. And we need the other hand. Now, we, are, we have received that whenever we were about to reach a peace treaty, we destroyed settlements. We pulled out the civilians, we pulled out the soldiers, and we destroyed the settlements. Either at the peace treaty with Egypt in Sinai, and in the Gaza Strip, and in four settlements in the West Bank. So I think that uh, what happened in the uh, Palestinian Authority, practically, when the Intifada broke out, Mahmoud Abbas at that time was number two. He was not even the deputy, but he was number two at the hierarchy at the Fatah movement. He knocked on the door of Yasser Arafat and came in and told him, Ya Abu Ammar, if you are not going to block this flow of bloodshed, it's going to blow up in our face. And Arafat gave him some answers, and he was not satisfied with the answers. And he left the West Bank and went to Qatar to sit with his son for a few months. And for uh, seven years, under Yasser Arafat and under Mahmoud Abbas, they refused to fight against the terrorists. Refused. More than that, some counter-tourism apparatus became terror activities. simply became terrorists. Only when they've lost the Gaza Strip in June 07 in a military coup that lasted three days, and all assets of the Palestinian Authority were handed over to the hands of Hamas in Gaza Strip. Only then, the administration under Mahmoud Abbas understood if it's not going to be different in the West Bank. They might lose the West Bank, but of course Israel will not allow Hamas to take over the West Bank because of its uh, security. And we've suffered from Hamas in the West Bank quite a lot. We've lost 900 Israelis in three years, 01, 02, 03 mainly in suicide bombings launched by Hamas and other terror activ activities. Gaza Strip is totally dominated by Hamas since June 07. Mahmoud Abbas and his ministers haven't visited Gaza Strip for more than seven years. No way that Hamas will launch a military coup in the West Bank because it's too risky not only for the West Bank, for the Palestinian Authority, it's too risky for the state of Israel. But more than that, Gaza Strip is equipped today with a large variety of military weapons. It's rockets, it's anti-tanks, uh, uh, missiles, anti-aircraft, bombs, etc., etc. Well, as we all know, uh, with bayonets, you can do everything except sitting on it. And with missiles and rockets, you can do everything. You cannot sit on it. I'm sure that in any peace process, let alone in any peace treaty, Gaza Strip will be demilitarized for military weapon. And the first and the second and third option is to be done by the Palestinians getting assistance from Egypt or from any other country. 
The last option, but it's an option, is that it's going to be done by the state of Israel. If we shall have to do it by ourselves, it's not a matter of weeks, it's not a matter of months, it's a matter of years. We have to be fully prepared to such a step. But as I said, it's the last option. I myself, I live uh, with my wife, we live in Ashkelon, that's my hometown, 10 kilometers from Gaza Strip. Just 10 days ago, they woke up at night, 1.30 at night, you hear the siren, you run to the shelters, you hear the Iron Dome is hitting the five uh, out of six rockets. The sixth one fell uh, in an open area. And you get back to sleep. From close to 14,000 rockets that were launched during the last 11 years, we've lost 22 Israelis. We've lost in one suicide bombing at the Passover night in Park Hotel in Natania, 30 Israelis in one event. But the rockets create a different issue. It creates a war of attrition. Thank God we have developed the Iron Dome and we know how to contain the threat, but it doesn't eliminate it. In order to eliminate it, you need different options. So we are still young. We know our partners, including Hamas leaders and terrorists in the Gaza Strip. And I hope that they will be smart enough not to try to grab us to use the option too fast, too early. My name is Larry Finder from Houston, Texas. My question has to do with uh, red lines. In the past 18 months, we've heard about red lines from the President of the United States in conjunction with Iran and Syria. And we've heard Prime Minister Netanyahu talk about red lines when it comes to Iran's capability of building a nuclear bomb. From the uh, perspective of the President, it seems to me at least sometimes the red line may move. But my question is, how serious do you think Prime Minister Netanyahu is when he says that he will not permit Iran to have a nuclear bomb, even at the risk of going at it alone? Thank you. <coughs> you know, I basically hate red lines. Because I think that what happened to President Obama happens to many other leaders. You put a red line, and then you have to move. We in Israel, we, we were about to draw a red line in exchanging terrorists with Israeli kidnapped soldiers or bodies of soldiers. And thank God, at the end, we had a committee that uh, recommended it, but thank God it was not done yet. With the Iranian nuclear bombs, it's a bit different because Iran, the former president, stated loud and clear, I intend to destroy the state of Israel. It's an Iranian president. I intend to destroy the state of Israel. And all Israelis who immigrated to Israel post-1948 will have to go back to their original lands. So my parents are Holocaust survivors from Poland. I have to go back to Poland. Uh, had the ambassador was Israeli, you have to go back to Armenia. And uh, everyone here uh, should go back to his original land. Now, in my mind, and probably in many minds, when you have capabilities and intentions, it becomes dangerous. So the intentions, Despite the fact that, you know, internal services are ready to pay everything to know what's going on in your enemy's leader's mind. I'm sure that the CIA would have paid uh, everything to know what's going on in uh, Osama bin Laden's mind before he lost his mind. But uh, we are ready to do it with Hassan al-Salla and many other countries are really ready to pay everything to get the information for what's the intentions. The intentions is the top of the tops 
of uh, what an intelligence service is trying to get from leaders. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is the president of Iran, frustrated every intelligence service. He put this information loud and clear, free of charge. He said his intentions. Now, he said it not in a, in a small room or a, in a tete-a-tete -tete meeting. He said it loud and clear in front of the microphone. That's why when you have intentions expressed by a leader, an authorized leader, that was not denied by anyone, mainly by the spiritual leader in Iran, and you know that in Iran, the spiritual leader, he decides about the strategy. And he hasn't changed the strategy of Iran, not even after the agreement between the Western countries and uh, Iran about the nuclear project. So when you know that the intentions are very clear, cannot be more clear than it was expressed, and you have the building of the bombs, you have to do two steps. First of all, to build a defensive system. That's what Israel is doing at the beginning by itself, later on in a joint venture with the United States. And we are building a system that is going to be able to defend the state of Israel, and maybe not only the state of Israel, against long-range missiles might having a warhead with the nuclear capabilities, and by creating offensive systems. And we in the Middle East, we have a very basic rule. Before they want to get you for dinner, you have to get them for lunch. Helene <laughs> Sadok from Houston, Texas. We talked, you talked about the settlements and its importance. I'd like you to speak somewhat about the EU and many diplomats within the European diplomatic community who say settlements are the central issue. How would you answer them about larger issues, or would you agree? Or is it just a canard not to, um, not to solve larger issues? Thank you. As we are discussing the Israeli-Palestinian problems, the settlements are part of the problem in the Palestinian eyes. And over the discussions uh, since Oslo Agreement till today, we had many versions of what kind of exchange is going to be. It's well understood, for example, that one cluster of settlements, Gush Etzion, that never mind how you uh, watch it, it will remain part of the State of Israel. To remind you, it was a part of the State of Israel before 1948 and was taken by the Jordanians uh, and during the Independence War. So we do understand that some settlements will remain. When, we ask, when I say we, it means the Israelis, the Palestinians, the Americans, the EU, and the, uh, and the Arab countries. We understand that some settlements will remain. And the question is what kind of exchange is going to be, where we are going to uh, exchange land towards uh, those uh, settlements. And I think that without having an agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians. So at least we have proved to ourselves first, and then to the Palestinians, and then to the whole world, that whenever Israel is determined to build, we build. Whenever we are determined to destroy, we destroy. Not with joy, not with happiness, because we destroy houses of people who are living there. They were sent to live there by the Israeli government. But nevertheless, we knew how to do it in the past. I'm sure we'll know how to do it in the future. So why should we destroy during the process or the condition to the process? Unfortunately, we only have time for one last question. We've been waiting. My name is George Shamia. I'm originally from Ramallah. 
and I appreciate your thoughts about uh, about Gaza and, and the West Bank. I am too a proponent for the two-state solution. And I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, before Obama went to uh, Israel and the West Bank, it was asked by uh, asked of Shipley Tilhami, who's at the University of Maryland, and Hanan Shrawi, who's the executive director of the PLO. What exactly is the peace process going to be comprised of? And both of them said, without Hamas, there can be no peace with Israel. What are your thoughts? Maybe you've already said it. Maybe you can say it again. What are your thoughts about the inclusion of Hamas in the current peace talk between Fatah and the Israelis? Thank you. You know, I'm too many years in this business. And when Hamas was established, the date the day celebrate the establishment of Hamas is December 14th, 1987. Unfortunately, my birthday is December 14th. So I have to celebrate it together with them. But if you read very carefully the charter of Hamas, written in August 1988, by the people who today, those who remain alive, of course, those people who wrote it are today the leaders of Hamas terror organization. It's a terror organization. There's no other way to describe Hamas. You know, I remember here in the States in Washington, when I was head of Shin Bet, Secretary of State was uh, uh, Condi Rice. And there was a meeting, it was supposed to be 2004, I think. It was a meeting in uh, Saudi Arabia between Fatah movement and Hamas to create a reconciliation between them and uh, to make it one united uh, group. And we were sitting in the room and her assistant, showed her a note written, they have reached an agreement. And she looked at me and said, Avi, it's about to happen. I said, Miss uh, Secretary of State, I'm telling you that accept the statement. An agreement was reached, you'll get no details. She said, why? I said, because there are no details. There's no way to reach an agreement while Hamas is eager, and I'm speaking about 2004, to remind you they took over in Gaza only in 2007. And after an hour, the details didn't arrive and it was well understood that nothing was achieved in Saudi Arabia. And since then, for every few years, a few months, depending on the time, you get another, uh, another meeting. Hamas declared themselves, when the Muslim Brotherhood came into power in Egypt, they declared themselves, we are part of the Muslim Brotherhood, the Palestinian version. In the Charter of 88, it's written loud and clear. that any Jewish people and Christian people, they don't remind it by names, that will hide behind the last one. If he behinds behind a tree or a rock, so the tree and the rock has to tell the authorities that behind me there is the last Jew or Christian to be killed. Now, it's not the name Hamas. Hamas is a Harakat al Mukawam al Islamiyah, it's the Islamic uh, uh, resistance movement. It's a name that we can live with. It's not the name, it's the context. If Hamas is getting changed, there's no way that Israel will say we don't speak with Hamas 
under a different ideology. I think that even Fatah movement, mainly today, when they know that the Gaza Strip, it's not a shadow government. You know, Ambassador, some people believe that in Gaza Strip, there is a shadow government, that the government of the Palestinian Authority is in Ramallah, and in Gaza, it's a shadow government. No, they don't see it as a shadow government. It's a government. It's a, a totally independent entity. They have a prime minister. Khaled Mashar sees himself as the president when Hosni Mubarak invited both of them to Cairo. And the one that was supposed to speak was uh, Mahmoud Abbas and the two prime ministers. At that time, uh, Salam Fayyad from the Palestinian Authority and Ismail Haniya from the Hamas. Khaled Mishra said, if I'm not speaking as well, nobody is coming. So the two, the president, Mahmoud Abbas, and the so-called president, Khaled Mishal, talked as presidents, and then the two prime ministers. As I said before, the state of Israel should be very determined. And I think that the United States, as a superpower, the real superpower, who really is trying to create something we should all be very determined that the talks will be with one Palestinian authority that has one law. Otherwise, we shall start talking with Palestinian authority about West Bank, Hamas about the Gaza Strip, then the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, PIJ, will split from the uh, Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and will take the Sumeria area, and we shall start to speak with the PIJ about Sumeria area, and we'll... that's not the system. That's not the system we can cope with. We have started this route in 1993. I'm telling you, I was in Gaza Strip. I was in charge of the Gaza Strip on behalf of Shin Bet. With these two hands, I handed over rifles to the troops that came from Sinai into the Gaza Strip. In one day, in one day, I got a call from the head of Shin Bet. He told me those fugitives that you're running after to catch them, or if it's not possible to kill them, you have to sit with them and to set up a new situation on the ground. And we set up with them. We talked to them. And we set up a new situation on the ground. Unfortunately, it exploded, but it doesn't mean that it should be exploded till the end of uh, their life or our life. We know the people, we know ourselves, and as the ambassador said, we are, do understand that at the end of the day, we shall have a peace treaty between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I hope it will happen as soon as possible. But as I said before, we shouldn't say that the time is against us. Otherwise, we are going to make mistakes, and I don't like to make mistakes. Thank you very much.